we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us um, today. We're excited to see so much interest in uh, these virtual roundtables. I know there's been a lot of different topic areas. You know, you all may have participated in, in some different ones um, throughout the week or so that they've been offered. So excited to be able to continue to connect um, with you as colleagues um, and just continue our discussion in what is unfortunately our new normal. Um, so uh, we'll do a few housekeeping items real quick and then we'll just jump right into the discussion. So uh, my name is Jess Gentry. I'm serving as one of the co-facilitators today. I'm an associate director of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, Erin Wells is an associate director at UT Austin. She's also serving as a co-facilitator. Um, and then Amy Lanham is a senior associate director at Nebraska Lincoln and she's going to be helping monitor um, the comments in the chat box and bringing those um, up uh, for, for discussion as as kind of the conversation lends itself. So um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, you know, we do want to just focus on the impact on our facilities and our operations in campus rec. Um, while I'm sure we all have our own varying opinions on the politics around this and um, just the different recommendations that have come out in our respective states and areas, um, we're just trying to focus on the campus rec piece um, right now. As I mentioned, Amy's going to be monitoring the chat, so don't be alarmed um, if you enter a comment and, you know, she might comment back that she's going to call on you when, when a situation presents itself. Um, those kinds of things. So just a reminder, you've all been automatically muted. So um, we'll always leave a few seconds pause for us to get for you to get unmuted before you um, comment, but don't be alarmed if someone calls on you to specifically share um, what you've put in the chat. Uh, we are recording this. So if you have to duck out early or if you have colleagues that, you know, weren't able to make this, all of these roundtables are being recorded, um, including the transcription of the chat feature. So feel free to keep putting information in there. If you have thoughts about what you're doing at your institution on the specific topic that we're discussing, even if it doesn't get brought up, it's still valuable for our members to be able to read through that and see. So um, just feel free to dump as much information in there as we want. I know this is uncharted territory for a lot of us. So um, I, I think we're all just welcome to seeing what everyone else is doing and how we're all navigating this. So um, I will kick it over to Erin and she can get our conversation started. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So the first thing we kind of just wanted to <clears throat> throw out there is, um, how are y'all doing? What, what are your facilities looking like? Who, is there anybody that's still on campus and facilities are open or has everybody pretty much shut down operations and just kind of what it looks like going out there? So Jason, it looks like you're shut down until further notice. So what does that mean? Does anybody get to come into the facility? Um, do you still have zone maintenance coming in or anything like that? Uh, so this is Jason at Southern Miss. Um, the way we're handling it, um, a few of us have been designated to be on a, a remote team uh, to work from home and that's to do our distance programming. So um, we're doing exercise videos and, and esports for our intramural program. Um, as our facility side of it, um, that main staff has been put on administrative leave with recall status. So if I needed to at any point, we could say, hey, I need you to come in on this day and handle this. Um, we've been doing that mainly with our uh, aquatics coordinator. We're, we've actually made the decision to go ahead and drain our pool um, and shut the pumps down. And that way we're, we're being a little fiscally responsible with um, electricity, chemical cost. Um, so other than that, um, like I said, most staff, including our custodial is on the administrative leave. So um, no one really is operating in the facility. I know, Amy, didn't you say you still have an outdoor facility that's open? Um, we do at Nebraska. We have one of our recreation field areas um, that we're staffing from one to eight because we still have a significant amount of population living in the residence halls. And so um, practicing social distancing and, and limiting that space to only 10 users at a time. So yeah, it's been somewhat hear. challenging. Um, people are doing a great job on the chat too, where you guys are talking more about maybe your maintenance teams or a rotation that you have. 
some of your professional staff. So, um, and then people have also been like putting in the date of when they're shut down through. Um, so I guess, is there anybody that uh, wants to comment maybe a little bit more about that uh, uh, remote schedule or, or how you've kind of decided who is essential coming back onto campus? This is Meredith here at WPI Western Massachusetts. For our um, essential personnel, it was based upon specifically for our pool and aquatic. So one of our pool operators who also, we have a special relationship with him that he technically works for our Department of Facilities and Department of Athletics. Um, they have deemed him as essential personnel to be able to come in and with our essential personnel all over campus, they gave them new ID access cards. So all of ours are currently turned off. So no one um, can go on unless they have to call campus police or anyone of that nature. So. so for anyone who, you know, we've heard a lot about the people that are, the departments that are more or less closed for, for functional reasons, although we still, you know, staff might still be rotating in and out, but Anyone at a facility that, you know, somewhat like Amy at Nebraska Lincoln that is still open, maybe even somewhat of a limited capacity that can share um, how they're kind of navigating those waters. Like, you know, Amy mentioned kind of the one in one out <laughs> um, kind of thing. But for those of us that still might be trying to operate an open facility because that's the expectation of campus, could anyone share insight um, into what experience they've had with that so far? All right, well, I haven't seen anything in the chat come across as people still largely open, so. Um. Hey, Shay. Shay McMurray asked about <clears throat> retrieving locker items. So Shay, University of Texas at Austin was allowing that um, up until the mayor sent out the stay at home orders. We did kind of like what you heard about from Amy, we did like a 12 to two and social distancing and 10 people were allowed in the building at a time to retrieve items. They came in, they left. Um, we had doors propped so nobody had to touch anything, but we did allow that until the mayor put out the stay at home orders. Um, Ashley Miller, do you want to comment maybe about what Minnesota was doing there as well for retrieving items? Yeah, we opened it up um, on Wednesday and Thursday from noon to four. We had two of our pro staff and actually a couple of students just go in making sure that people didn't wander around the building while they were in there. Um, our mayor put in stay at home orders starting tomorrow. So we definitely won't be doing that after this, but I think we had, I mean, we have a large campus, but we had probably 150 people each day come in. So people definitely took advantage of it. Um, Aaron and Jess, there was something right off the board, um, not necessarily with accessing lockers, but it came to a question um, that Roger had about climbing walls. Hey, Roger, can you clarify that question a little bit more? What um, are you asking about like cleaning afterwards? Are they open? Can you just clarify that question a little bit more? Uh, yeah, uh, main thing is what are you guys doing to your climbing wall staff and then uh, like what kind of disinfectant things are you guys being able to do with equipment, shoes, all that kind of stuff? Well, being closed, we, our climbing wall is not open at this point in time. So um, completely closed, uh, student staff, we're trying to figure out remote operate, um, operating procedures right now for our student staff and trying to work through that. Um, our actual outdoor person oversees the climbing wall. So I don't know what steps he's going to be taking. So if anybody else has anything on that, uh, um, I don't know exactly how he'll be disinfecting after this. Hey, Roger, this is Justin Waters at East Carolina University. Our um, climb wall is also part of the facility and closed, but prior to students not being allowed on campus, um, I work with our <coughs> maintenance team and uh, pur purchased some um, 
specific tablets uh, that help kill a lot of viruses and bacteria and stuff. And we also use a product called Hepicide um, that's really beneficial, concentrated. Um, and I just bought a Ghostbuster Lowe's pack, uh, worked with our adventure team and belayed on up there and started from top to bottom and just sprayed it down and, and let it air dry. And then we uh, also took her off our mats and disinfected them and cleaned them as well as just a general wipe down of our, all of our equipment and our ropes. Hey, Todd, um, do you want to touch base on that Green Sports Alliance um, that you mentioned in the comments so people have a little more information? Uh, yeah, sure. I just saw it this morning, so I don't know if you're familiar with the Green Alliance. My experience with it is that it's definitely kind of oriented towards stadiums and so forth, but they are doing a webinar that I just saw advertised this morning. Uh, it's on April 1st. I believe it is at 10 o'clock Pacific time zone, so you can adjust accordingly. Um, and they do have a web page that I'm sure it's on there, so the Green Sports Alliance. But it looked like they were just looking at, you know, it's like, how do you clean a large, large scale um, facilities and it looked like the speakers were primarily uh, vendors so instead of uh, stadiums themselves or facilities hey Gabby, Gabby. <laughs> um, we also put the um, UT is also doing the Clorox 360 um, we've ordered a couple of those. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so the Clorox 360 machine is uh, a machine that was vetted by our health uh, department, or I'm sorry, our health center. And essentially, it's a little cart um, that you literally plug in a jug of disinfectant into it. And you can go into a room and disinfect it in about 30 seconds, an area that's like maybe like an 8 by 10. You can disinfect it in about 30 seconds. It's safe to use around electronics as long as, as, long as you stay um, four to six feet away from them. You're not like directly pointing at it. And the best way that I can describe it is like a steam, a steamer. If you've ever used a steamer, essentially you just start at the top of at the top right corner of the room and then you fumigate, bomb, whatever you want to call the, the room. You shut the door and then about two minutes after shutting the door, uh, you should be able to go back into the room without any odors. And the way that we're going to use this machine um, for our, our weight rooms is that the, the good thing about the machine is that it gets behind things. So you don't necessarily have to scrub or try to reach in between items. So this is gonna be really good for us with our, our weight room. So essentially you're just gonna fumigate the room and then let it sit for, you know, the, the, the vendor said about, two minutes, but we're going to go ahead and fumigate the room and let it sit for about five minutes before we let anybody else into the space, like custodial staff or anybody like that. And then that's how we're planning to sanitize some of our larger spaces that have nooks and crannies all over the place. If anybody has, or if anybody needs more information on that, I can definitely pri uh, chat with you privately too. Um, there was another one that came in from RJ Skinner um, talking about Environize. So do you want to maybe talk about that quick, RJ? And Hi there. Um, yeah, so we've been using this product called Environize. Uh, we got it from a local company here. Um, it's actually derived from water um, and it uh, does a whole other thing. Our sales guy does a really good job, but we were using that prior to um, this outbreak uh, when we've had other issues in locker rooms with uh, uh, our, our varsity sports team locker rooms with mumps or other things um, and we've used it on the shared equipment um, and so yeah just like I mentioned prior to the outbreak we had increased that frequency in uh, all of our spaces and the regular spaces um, and then after our uh, total closure we went through and we did all of the spaces afterwards so and it's just a product that's uh, mixed to be a, a dilution station and then uses whatever atomizer equipment um, you would have um, available or ordered 
with it. We have a gun, a handheld gun, a backpack, Ghostbuster sprayer, as well as uh, a fogger like you would use for fogging mosquitoes outdoors if any of you are unfortunate enough to live in an environment with mosquitoes. Well, thanks for all that information about, I mean, I think personally, I mean, I know I'm supposed to be facilitating this, but I'm taking notes because I know it's one of those things that I think right now we're so caught up in like what this new norm is that, you know, pivoting our thoughts to like, holy crap, we're going to have to reopen at some point. And it's not like we can just unlock the doors <laughs> and be good to go. So um, I think this is all, you know, great information. Um, we have had a lot of comments come in related to student staff. So let's pivot to that. Um, for the time being, um, and just to try and put the conversation in buckets, if we will, because I know there's a few different things. So um, let's talk first about just if your university has issued any type of pay continuation. So I know a few universities, mine being one, we just learned on Sunday that we um, were directed to continue paying our students whether they're working or not. And then once we navigate through what that conversation looks like, there's also, um, I think the next one we can go to is the remote work for students. So um, just trying to be mindful of keeping the topics separate, um, just for ease of people being able to get the valuable information. So um, anyone want to provide any insight into, you know, their institution's expectations for continuing to pay their students? Yeah, I see Justin. Hey, this is Justin in East Carolina. Um, the North Carolina system is providing direct direction, so we're all alike um, across our public institutions. Currently, um, they have only said that we will pay from March 15th pay period to the March 31st pay period, and it will be an average of the students' work hours for the month of February. Obviously, that presents a lot of issues when we just hired softball officials and different officials that maybe haven't taken the field or, or worked for us yet. Um, but we only have direction through April 1st, um, but we're moving to try to pay as we can and looking at different things for teleworking, um, which we have been approved for, um, just kind of figuring all those things out. Anyone else with? Yeah, hey, this is, this is Gabby at Virginia Tech. So the only directive that we have been given by the university to pay out our students um, has been the work study students. Um, and those have been input through the end of the semester as paid. Um, like if they had a Monday, Wednesday shift, then we have added those Monday, Wednesday shifts for the remainder of the, of the semester. And they will be paid out as the pay period closes. Um, for other students that did not have work study um, in that capacity. We are looking for some telework that they can do. Um, some of the students are actually on grounds trying to clean some of the areas uh, that, you know, we've deemed that are safe for them to be in that space. Um, but for most of them, unfortunately, at this time, we have not been able to find anything except for work study people. Anyone else on the pay continuation? I will say one thing we're looking at departmentally is um, we have several values and, and I, as I'm sure we all do. And one of ours is communication. So we're looking at if we can pay for a um, program to teach our students a foreign language um, and have them learn that. And that would be you know very beneficial moving on. Um, and currently looking at Spanish. Hey, Ross, do you want to talk a little bit about like the LinkedIn learnings that UT is allowing? Yeah. Um, hey, guys, I'm Ross Rodriguez with the University of Texas at Austin with Aaron. Um, we've got a couple different remote things that we're trying to work on. First, um, we were we, like um, our, our partners across the country. We allowed our work study students to get paid for the remainder of the semester as well based on their schedules. Um, and then for everyone else who was on our schedule, they're allowed to work or to take virtual like LinkedIn learning modules that equal to their scheduled hours. So if I was scheduled for 10 hours a week with recreational sports, I could take the equivalent of remote learning possibilities through LinkedIn learning or attending things like uh, these NURSA webinars. I think we have at least one of our outdoor satellite staff members who's sitting in on this today. So, hey, Brooks. Um, but yeah, we're we're trying to come up with things where uh, they can take they can participate in NURSA webinars 
LinkedIn learning sessions, especially ones that tie back to our NACE competencies that we hit home. Can I jump in, Jess? Yeah, absolutely, Jesse. Hi, this is OC Weefall from Texas A&M. Um, so we have a leadership coordinator on our staff, and so we unfortunately can't pay students for not working, but what our director has agreed to is he puts on student development series based on different type of competencies for leadership and for promotions and different topics and whatnot. And so he has developed a program to where through Zoom or through Slido, he will present those real time students from um, the entire rec sports program can tune in. They'll have to complete either a type of quiz or some type of reflection piece on it. And they will be given time work for completing those and attending those. And I think he has four scheduled out for the remainder of the year. And these continue throughout um, the, the full academic year that he does in person. But this was just another way for us to get a big bulk of students some hours um, at possible, as well as give them some developmental school skills which fall in line with the university mission. What are what are some um, if anybody's doing remote work? What is some of the the remote work that you're allowing your students to participate in? Like for example, we're having some of ours look over our training checklist and what worked for them, what didn't, what's missing, what's you know things like that. Are there any other types of remote work that you're allowing or putting your students in groups with? Does that make sense? Hello, um, my name is uh, Brandon DeRosha. I'm calling, or I'm from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So yeah, we've been directed to pay our student staff um, basically an average of what they're supposed to be, do, uh, what they normally would be doing for the semester. And what we've done is we're basically trying to create a giant database of online content for our that's created by our students. And so we have them create, you know one minute cooking videos, things of that nature. And then that gets kind of assigned a time amount that we kind of estimate on how long it took them to make. And that's kind of how we're gonna be paying them uh, as they go. And then we do have inward facing stuff too, uh, regarding manual uh, manuals that we're having uh, students go over as well as uh, we're trying to create some online training modules. Uh, something that we've always talked about as a group but now it's nice to actually have some time to create these online training modules to help have our students uh, be able to watch those later on. Um, I don't know who this is, but at ESU, um, your hiring committee stuff, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Gerard, uh, my name is Gerard Morgan. I'm, calling, I'm from East Charlesburg University in Pennsylvania. Um, we have a staff of about eight hiring committees, uh, eight, eight people on a hiring committee that are all students. Um, it consists of two hiring chairs and then six other members that come in and they'll review resumes of all the students who apply and then reach out to and interview all the students who apply and then end up hiring those students. So the pro staff actually has little to no involvement in the hiring of the rec students. It's all this eight person hiring committee. So they're getting paid for their time spent reviewing resumes and interviewing students. So to kind of pivot off of that, Gerard, what is everybody doing? So again, thinking about like very optimistic, you know, at some point we will reopen um, and things will get back to, you know, whatever normal is at that point in time. But I know one of the things we've talked with our staff about and we haven't really operationalized, operationalized a plan <laughs> yet is, you know, being able to hire students and do promotional opportunities and such. I would imagine a lot of people towards the end of the semester are starting to get staff in place, you know, for leadership positions as people graduate and move on for other, you know, just positions as um, individuals graduate and move on. So if anyone has already put a little more thought into what, you know, intent is being put into that now remotely um, to help put you in a better place when we do reopen, whether that's in, one month or three months or six months or whatever it ends up being. So it looks like Sarah Shea, um, you wanna talk about what you're doing at Commerce?
Man, I was afraid you were going to make me actually. <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah, so we're doing a couple of different things. Um, for remote learning in general, we have told all of our staff we're only giving them 10 hours to make uh, a week to be fair across the board. Um, so program assistants, they might be working on projects and things like that, but they're still only going to get their 10 hours along with our 70 other students that are doing other remote learning. Um, for hiring though, we were actually in the middle of lifeguard interviews when this all happened and then we were starting to transition into our building soup interviews. Um, so a graduate assistant is working on a timeline and we're going to start next week where they'll still, the building soup interviews, they're going to attach their resume cover letter to a Qualtrics form. And then instead of doing a committee, which is what we normally do with student staff, it's just going to be the graduate assistant and I zooming with them to do their interview because our concern is is that if we don't at least get our building suits bought back in to when we reopen we're not going to be able to reopen because um, that's the staff that we have to have in the building um, so we're going to go ahead and get them interviewed and hired virtually through zoom and then we'll start working our way down the only ones we can't do is our entry level um, the university has said right now we're kind of we're not totally said we can't do entry level interviews, but right now we can only focus on our um, middle level tiered and our supervisor levels. Is anybody else thinking about <clears throat> like how we start this back up? Um, so like the university says you're open July or yeah, June 3rd. When, when are you then gonna open your facility? Like, are you gonna slow roll things out? Like University of Texas, we have multiple facilities and we're working on a plan on how those are gonna get opened. Kind of like, like I said, on the slow roll, like, are you gonna start with reduced hours or is, are you going full steam right back into it? What, are people talking about that yet? So this is OC again with A&M. Um, We've been told after the two week um, shelter in place from the governor that we are planning to open April 8th. And so prior to this, we were still open prior to everyone being shut down and we were operating on limited hours where we did like a 10 to two in the morning and then a five to eight in the evening and where in between we did a cleaning with our staff of the facility before we let folks in. We took our satellite facilities offline but once we do come back to eighth, we do have our outdoor facility, which will be opening for a short period of time. And in the meantime, we do plan to implement all the different things with the 10 person maximums, the social distancing. And our plan right now is to limit activities on courts to simply our badminton, um, pickleball individuals in the racquetball courts, and then in the strength and conditioning room, they have to sign up for times on the hour based on that 50 person um, maximum. And during that time frame, once they get done, we'll allow the next group to come in, basically like a like you're going into a club, one in, one out situation. Have you set up your machines in any way that so that they social distance within there? So like let's say somebody wants to do arms and legs and they're right next to each other, are they they're not allowed to do that? Would Correct. Be Most most of the machines have either signs put on them or have been taken offline to um, encourage that and make the decision for them. We've taken our cardio on the second and third floors off limits as well too. Wow. What about other people? How, how do you see yourself reopening? So um, I'm with Loyola University Chicago and we actually have been really lucky. Um, the communication lines have been open um, with upward administration and we have said like, we would love to be able to reopen right off the bat full speed, but we don't know that we're going to have the staff to do that because our staff got sent home from campus. Um, and so they've asked us to be forward thinking and start projecting if we reopen in April. Do we have enough staff to open on break hours? Do we have enough staff to open full time hours? If it's not till May, do we have enough staff for break hours? Do we have enough staff for full hours? Um, and they've been very understanding, just we've communicated, hey, we think we have enough to do the pool on break hours, but the rest of the building, normal hours, or, um, you know, just, just communicating that upwards has helped us a lot. So to, there was a question a little while ago in the chat, and I didn't capture the name, but um, for those, uh, there was a comment about 
helping students apply for unemployment, um, if that's something that they might qualify for based on just the circumstances in, in the state um, in, which, in which they live. Uh, like I said, I missed who commented on that, but if they could, wouldn't mind kicking the conversation off. And then if anyone else has any thoughts or experience um, with that, uh, I think a lot of us would be all ears as far as what we might be able to implement. To me that it brought that point up uh chris wormy in uh regina which is in canada so obviously this is probably going to be different uh for us than it is for for american schools uh, but the way it works with us is we all of our student staff are uh, hired on a casual basis so they work in the facility um and we basically schedule a month at a time so what our university agreed to do was to uh pay them out for whatever schedules shifts they had so the majority of the, the schedules went to the end of March. So we paid them until the end of March. Uh, then their final date that they worked was submitted. Um, and then they get what's called a record of, of employment from us. So essentially they're, they're laid off for, for lack of a better term, but then that provides them the ability to then apply for the unemployment insurance. Is there anyone on the call from, um, the states that has any experience with unemployment? This is Todd at Portland State. We're trying to navigate this for our students. At this point in time, we've been told that if they are enrolled for six or more credits, they do not qualify at this time for unemployment. Uh, and that's about the most definitive word that we've been given. We have been told that they may, that we may at some point in time start to encourage them to enroll even though they don't qualify because in the weeks to come there's the possibility of the laws being relaxed but that's the most definitive that we have in the state of Oregon. Can I can I go off a topic that Nick Lumpkin put in the chat about going straight into summer hours and then following a week of deep cleaning. So um, what does that mean, deep cleaning? Are you going to bring in an out, outside company to do this? Or are you going to use like a machine like what Gabby had talked about or um, others earlier? Like, what does that look like, that week of deep clean? Sure. And we're still working on that plan. But um, currently, our housekeeping and maintenance teams are both still on campus. Um, so our housekeeping has that Clorox 360 machine. So they've been using that. They're using that in the building right now. Um, so for us, it's more of uh, taking the time to actually deep clean like cardio equipment, things like that, that our housekeeping team won't touch, then have them use that Clorox 360 on that, stripping the climbing wall. Um, those types of things that we just don't get to do while we're open, um, given that students aren't on campus and they're finishing the semester remotely anyways, um, our goal isn't to rush back into it and kind of take advantage of that to get students back in town um, see who comes back, you know, all those types of things. Thanks. I was just wondering, is anybody else considering hiring a company to come in at the end of all of this to, to do their deep clean or is most, are most going to do it in house? Uh, Brandon DeRocha from UNLV. We are, so we are in kind of a unique situation where we, um, the custodial staff that I supervise, they clean the rec center and they also clean the student health center that is attached to our building. And we had our first case of COVID-19 in that health center recently. And now uh, all of my custodial staff have taken up the president's offer to take administrative leave with pay. So I don't currently have anybody to clean the health center. So they're going to be, uh, we're going to be hiring actually our pest control company to come in and do that exact uh, clean. They have this stuff called NISIS 22 uh, that they're going to be doing with uh, um, the uh, uh, basically those misters, uh, so to speak, in the health center uh, to get that all cleaned up. And then I did have an aside question. Does anybody else have that kind of unique setup where they oversee super or they oversee custodial staff that work in a health center connected to your building? Yes, we have that at Virginia Tech. Okay. Have you had any problems with the with the staff? Uh, uh, wanting to come into work? 
So right now, the way that we have decided to do our housekeeping staff schedule has been to go on an on-call type of rotation. So two, at least two of them go in at a time and they do some basic maintenance and cleaning if they are not an at-risk population. We do have one of our custodial staff who is an at-risk in the at-risk population. Therefore, I am working with him on a special assigned project so that he can work from home with me. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so we just finalized the rotation and we started putting that rotation into place as of Wednesday of this week. Does that answer your question? Oh yeah, yeah. I just uh, it's fortunate that 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 they haven't yeah and I don't know what, what it was like there, but yeah our president basically came out and said anybody who doesn't feel comfortable working can take admin leave with pay. And of course a lot of people are going to take that. Um, so I didn't know if that was something that that your university has gone through either. Ours are, um, our entire facility operations team and uh, maintenance staff and housekeeping staff are considered essential personnel. Now, when we talk about essential personnel, that was more weather related. So like, for example, on snow days, we're still expected to show up to work or take a, uh, an annual day for ourselves. Um, so this being a little bit different, we have been able to give, get creative with what we are doing. And so for us now, there is just, with the facility totally shut down, there's not enough work for eight of our custodial staff to be in, in the building at the same time cleaning and, and doing those sort of stuff. And same thing with our maintenance team. So um, we have developed a, a rotation schedule of when they physically go in. And like I said, at least two at a time, sometimes three, depending on what they're gonna work on. And, and um, that's how we're handling it at Virginia Tech. So if I can interject uh, really quickly, uh, we don't have to have a discussion around this, but there was a comment about just uh, interest in knowing all the different kind of um, cleaners and cleaning solutions and disinfectants that people are using. So I, I see a lot of people have already put theirs in, but if you haven't um, entered theirs yet, just please go ahead and do that. Somebody just shared their screen. Raul. Okay. <laughs> Hey, I had one for, um, I'm so sorry if I am going to slaughter your name, Michaelia from SNHU. That is an interesting comment. What, what do you mean is set up as a surge site and the National Guard's going to bring people in? Uh, yeah, so they just announced um, a couple of days ago that they're going to be bringing in the National Guard. They've set up in both of our gyms. One gym is going to be dedicated to COVID positive patients. Um, another to COVID negative to keep everyone separate. Um, but it's going to be for monitoring, um, from my understanding, monitoring patients for anywhere from 48 to 72 hours. Um, and that's been set up through the city of Manchester and the National Guard um, and different programs such as that. Is there anybody else that their facilities are being used as, um, as uh, COVID sites? Or their West talk. Florida, we've got the option uh, for our field house to be used as a site. It's on the state list of emergency management facilities. That would be only if locally we run into an issue. We're not there yet. In Strasburg, it was talked about. Um, I think it's still currently being discussed, but it would be our dorms, I believe, to be able to keep people in. Now, is that... Um patients or is that the um, i've heard dorms being used across the nation for um healthcare workers and first responders so that they don't go home and spread so is that for patients or is that for first responders good question i'm not entirely sure oh. <laughs> yeah i know it so i think I, we my may have already answered this somewhat um or maybe there isn't really an answer because you know we've kind of assessed what we're all doing in our facilities now but if there's anyone that's you know the the way that things are operating um in their state or province right now do allow reasonable access um to the facility whether they're closed or open are you taking the opportunity to do any you know of our repairs and renovations projects um anything of that nature or, you know, have we all just kind of pivoted to, you know, the cleaning and, and disinfectant piece. Yeah, 
This is Jeremy Chance with KU. Um, all of our office admin staff is working remotely, but we do have our daily mate, or our professional full-time maintenance staff as well as custodial who are working overnight. Um, so they're deemed essential by the university. So I, I believe they're taking this opportunity to do some painting, some repairs, um, that type of work that they wouldn't be able to do normally during um, the normal work times. Um, and then our overnight custodial is, you know, able to kind of do that type of, that same type of stuff as well. This is Amy at Nebraska, and we um, are doing a tile project that we continue to do. So they're demoing out old tile that was part of the facility and then installing new. But we did have a capital project that got pulled from the table just because of the um, unknown with the financial. So our university made the decision that anything that was capital construction that wasn't at a certain point um, within the project schedule got put on pause. Uh, ben, do you want to talk about what you're doing at Boise State and maybe how you've been able to continue that, um, just kind of how you work around just maybe the different restrictions and such in place? Sure. Um, so we closed last week, like a lot of folks, um, but our facility foreman and then our full-time custodians are deemed essential by the university and can continue to go in. Um, we had a conversation with the university like the folks who run our projects essentially and they said everything is still on at the state level so we've got three capital projects going on um, we just did a underwater pool lights we chose we drained the pool and did those at this time since we're closed and our foreman can still be there um, and vendors are still coming through as normal hey ben will you explain what the foreman is yeah sorry it's Idaho classification, don't love it. Um, it's essentially a maintenance manager. And we're also gonna try and do our wood floor remo or refinish now instead of wait till the summer when we have to close again for it. So trying to get some of that stuff done while staff are still allowed to be there. Hey Jess, can I jump in on this? James Nash from Texas A&M. Uh, much like Ben, we are doing everything possible to get all of our constructions in. Construction is one of the things that that can still consider an essential duty. So anything that we have going, we have a couple of rec centers being ones in the planning stage and the other ones being constructed. Those are still fully going. Uh, we are trying to contact all of our vendors if they're working to come in to give us estimates to look at maybe moving up some timelines to get some projects done while students aren't there. So uh, we have, I, we look at it as an opportunity to get some projects done and, and some much needed maintenance done to the facilities. Hey, James, this is Ross at UT Austin. I was wondering, the people who are going in to do those services, are they all professionals or do you guys have the ability to, like if you're changing out lights in your buildings and students traditionally would change them out, can you use students to do those projects? Uh, we have a maintenance, uh, maintenance and custodial crew uh, tied to the building. So once a work order or Aggie works is submitted, they go in, they make all the adjustments, they do all of our light changing anyway. So those folks are still working. Like with the question with cleaning, our custodial staff is cleaning everything. We may go into the weight and strength conditioning area and do some extra work, but that's not our plan. Any extra work we will do with our students the night before we are allowed to occupy our building. Does anybody um, contract some of these services out that may be like uh, the, the cleaning, the um, like UT doesn't use um, campus on campus we contract out, but we, it's a small business and we're really concerned about how they're going to survive this time. Is anybody else kind of in that situation with anybody they contract services out through and how these small businesses are gonna get through it? Okay. <laughs> hey, this is Justin in East Carolina. I know we're reaching out to some of our vendors that we utilize, for example, um, and when we replace uh, upholstery for uh, the weight room, we're going ahead and 
pulled as many pieces as we can um, prior to the more special distancing that happened. So just reaching out to him at our upholstery that we have to try to give him some work during this time um, was one of the things that we had. And we also reached out to our uh, the person that usually paints for our facility. And they said that they were still open to working um, and we were getting quotes to actively get them in the facility as well. Do some touch up work. Oh, this is Anita Moran. Hi, Anita, you, you muted yourself. I mean, how's that? Hi, <laughs> Erin. I'm an architect and a couple of thoughts related to several of the things that have been discussed. First of all, I would look for, I think construction prices will start dropping toward the end of the year. Obviously, projects that are in line right now, um, prices are fixed. But, you know, if you do have some money and you do have some ambitions, um, prices are going to be cheaper for a while. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is as it relates to small businesses, I was just on another Zoom meeting with the American Institute of Architects. So that's our professional organization. And they are actively banning, uh, creating networks of small firms so that those small firms can make it through these tough times. Now, whether that would work with a cleaning vendor or not, but a thought would be to ask them to align with another, with another cleaning firm. So to pivot back to, you know, our facilities largely being closed or even if they are open, you know, on a limited basis, what is everyone doing as it relates to any subscription services? Um, you may have that maybe aren't contracted. So if you think about, you know, if we pay for different TV or different music, those kinds of things, has anyone been able to hold payments on those? How have they gone about, um, you know, facilitating that discussion with the different vendors? This is Catherine with Loyola University of Chicago. Um, we reached out to both, we have a music subscription service and our TV subscription service. Reached out to both and just said, hey, um, now's a good time. We're sitting not doing much. We might start comparison shopping. Do you think you can close our, or pause our payments for a month or two months? And both vendors are very much like, we don't want to lose your business. Let's do this. Um, so we lucked out. We just reached out a simple phone call. Anyone else that's had success with something like that? Can anybody not pay during this time? Like I, I'm, if we aren't getting the, like if we aren't using the services and we're not, then I'm pretty sure the state of Texas can't pay for it. So like we have to shut down all of those subscriptions. Is anybody else in that boat? Who's um, CSUF um, K Maxi? Hmm. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is Ken. I'm with Cal State Fullerton. Um, yeah, we're not able to renew any subscriptions. Um, like, for example, I think our music subscription is coming due in May. Um, and obviously, Southern California, we're a big moving target on when we're going to be able to reopen. So that's just a subscription that I've already reached out to the vendor and they know we're not going to renew until we at least have some sort of direction on when we're opening. But as far as our other ones, um, we, we use Fusion. Um, I've already sent them their quarterly license. And um, yeah, that's the only other one we have. Uh, Ross was asking about any uh, employee scheduling softwares that people might use. So when to work, sub it up. Um, if people have been able to hold on or suspend any of those payments for the time being. Wow, all budgets are frozen. <laughs> SHU. Ugh. Yeah, you um, University of Texas is still using their one to work. We're, we're going to utilize it during this time frame. We, 
building off of that, Aaron, we we paid for our subscription for the whole year, so we're still in a good place where like we don't necessarily have to think about renewing ours right now. Um, ours will be up for renew in July or August, so depending on how long this goes, that may be a different conversation for us to have. Um, but we are still using it in a, a modified way for any students who do complete some distance learning opportunities. That's how we're also tracking their hours. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, Amy, you know, had mentioned how they are continuing to staff their outdoor spaces, but for those of us that have perhaps closed our outdoor spaces, but we also know how creative people can be in still accessing those spaces. Um, other than, you know, just scheduling staff out there full time, what resources have people reached out to on campus to help ensure, um, you know, that access isn't being being done so um, when our spaces are closed. This is Jeff Schmidt from the University of West Florida. Uh, I've been working with our campus police all week to uh, eliminate some or as much of the attractive nuisance of our outdoor facilities. We've taken the rims off our outdoor basketball courts. We've turned the breakers off of our, our basketball court and tennis court lights have switches that you can, uh, at the courts you can turn on or they were on a timer. We've turned the breakers off so that they don't come on at all. And that obviously signage and locking gates is what we've been able to do for the most part. Are there any other universities that have um, pulled rims off of outdoor basketball courts? We're kind of uh, at KU kind of wrestling with that decision, right? That, that decision right now as well. So I'm curious if others are also kind of going that same route. This is Stacy from UCLA. So I manage all of our outdoor rec spaces and um, we're having an issue with trespassing right now because we have a lot of places that are not notoriously locked. Our biggest one is tennis courts. So we've removed all the nets and poles from our tennis courts and literally as we're removing them, we still have people coming and entering our courts. Basketball was another one. We noticed that some people had hopped the fence and then opened the chained gate from the outside so that their friends could squeeze in. Um, our biggest issue is that most of these spaces are in the middle of housing and UCLA has not kicked off students off of campus. Um, I would say about 80% have already canceled their housing, but there are still people that are allowed to be on campus. They think that those are their right to use those, which is what our issue is. So we're we haven't taken rims off basketball courts yet. It is something we're looking at after our recent discovery yesterday with access into those courts, but we have removed all of our nets and poles for all of our outdoor tennis spaces. And we're kind of looking at some other locking mechanisms because we realize the chains and cabling locks that we've used on the gates are not stopping people from either hopping the fence or getting squeezing in through those somehow and getting into those spaces. Hey Ross, do you want to talk about what you're doing? Yeah, so with the University of Texas at Austin, I oversee four outdoor facilities that are spread out about three and a half miles from each other. One of them is kind of like a lost cause. Um, Clark Field on, on main campus, it doesn't have a fence, it doesn't have a gate. Uh, it's a wide open turf field that um, we have issues um, policing throughout the course of the semester, even when we have staff on site um, with people coming in from the community and just thinking that it's a wide open field and they can play. And so that one, we've put out some signage on the field in the middle of the field. That field didn't have any goals. That field didn't have any um, uh, any rims that we needed to take down. So it was just a wide open green space. We've kind of given up to the fact that it's going to get used. Um, and we've I've mentioned to our university police when I've been on campus um, that if you know, they see massive games being played. Maybe go have a conversation about social distancing. Um, but we're not, we've chosen that we're not going to try to kick people off of that field at this time. Um, our outdoor basketball courts, which we have uh, four at that site and then, and then uh, five more north of there, they're surrounded by t uh, 10 or 12 foot high fences and those are locked. And so we're in a good position with those. So we didn't feel we needed to pull rims or nets off of those net uh, goals at, those, at this time. Um, but then I also oversee a uh, 40 acre outdoor site that's got natural grass fields and turf grass fields and then an, also an archery range that archery range has kind of become a, a dog park uh people are using that as their exercise location for their dogs and at this time that's not a battle we've chosen to fight we just don't want to get into a fight with our homeowners association in the surrounding neighborhood 
um, with that with that issue. Uh, but one of the things we are considering is all, all of our natural grass and outdoor grass fields that have soccer goals on them. I was considering clamshelling those soccer goals and possibly locking them um, so that that discourages people from using our fields and using our, our goals for informal rec soccer. Ross, this is Jeff. We did dismantle our soccer goals and take all the nets down and put them away as well on our, our field space to help eliminate part of that because our field is wide open, similar to what you were describing as well. Yeah, Jeff, luckily our fields are surrounded by a brand new pretty fence that we put in with a renovation in 2015 or 17. Um, but there is an open spot in that fence because that fence runs through a floodplain, uh, it runs to a creek and borders a floodplain. Uh, so there's a weak spot in that fence line. But um, yeah, that's one of the things my, my supervisor and I were, have been discussing with whether or not we're going to dismantle our goals. And I think the decision has been made that until it's a problem, we don't want to emphasize it and encourage people to play. So we're luckily we've only had to chase off a handful of people from here and there. All right. Well, we are pretty close to um, our time limit. So I want to be, you know, still be respectful of people's times, even though our schedules are probably maybe a little more flexible than usual. Um, but just a couple uh, reminders next Friday at, you know, same time, one o'clock central, um, and then do your other own time zone math. It's not a strength of mine. Um, so next Friday, one o'clock central time, um, April 3rd, there is a joint uh, facilities-based webinar between NURSA, Akuho High, and ACUI. Um, there will be two representatives from each association on that call, so it'll be a little more formal than uh, maybe what you've seen here today or some of the other um, nurses specific ones that you've attended, but it's another great um, facilities-based conversation where we can kind of see what's going on in other spaces across campus, not just campus rec ones. And then we will be hosting um, another nurse based facilities virtual roundtable on April 10th at one o'clock as well. So um, again, thank you all, you know, so much for your engagement. Uh, we will read through um, all your comments. I know there were some pieces that we haven't been able to get to. So I think that's a great starting off point for our next call as far as, you know, refunding student fees, all, all kinds of fun things like that. Um, so, you know, really appreciate all the engagement, um, all the different links that are being provided. It looks like Aaron, put, Aaron O'Sullivan from headquarters put a link for um, the joint roundtable on facilities. So if you're wanting to register for that, um, that's in there. But otherwise, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing you again in a couple weeks and, you know, uh, just keep on keeping on. I think we're all doing the very best we can in these very awkward um, situations. So thank you all again so much. Yes, thank you. Everybody, please stay safe. Bye.